Hey, welcome to uh, another episode here at our leadership studio. I understand last week Kavita did a great job. She's maybe going to put me out of work here. I'm not sure, but I'm glad that you enjoyed talking, uh, meeting David Ruiz. He's a great friend of mine, and uh, uh, I know that he gave you a lot of good information. Tonight, another uh, great guest. We have Linda May is with us. Linda is the executive director of the Simmons Foundation. And as, as we see throughout the evening, you're going to get to meet her and see what a rich background uh, that Linda has. Welcome so much, Linda. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. So, Linda, you come from the foundation side, but you've also been a fundraiser. Um, and if you were building that book on you know, how to be a good fundraiser or about fundraising, what would some of the chapters be uh, in your book on fundraising and resource building? Well, I think the one thing you have to remember about fundraising is you have to have a passion for the thing you're fundraising for. Mm -hmm. So unless you really have a commitment to whatever the issue is, you're going gonna, gonna, you're gonna to be hard-pressed to make a case for it. So you need to be passionate mm. about the issue. You need to have a good case statement. And you need to spend time building relationships. Mm -hmm. I think relationships, people forget sometimes that you just can't ask somebody for money. You have to first create the bridge so that you can cross the bridge so that yeah. you can then ask for the funds. So once you build that trust and have a relationship with somebody, I think it's a lot easier to ask for money. When they understand that you're committed and that the, the, the effort is worth their investment, mm -hmm. and then they'll hopefully Get your passion. Yeah. Do you, do you find that there's people that come to you at the Simmons Foundation and they're missing some of those ingredients? Are there people asking you for money that have no passion or people that are asking you for money who've, who haven't bothered to build a relationship? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we are very open to new prospects. So if somebody calls us or contacts us who has never contacted us before, we'll certainly give it a look. So the relationship can happen, but I think it's that stewardship also that's important. So once yeah. you, once they get money, and it's interesting too for on my side, is that frequently somebody will ask us for money, they make a good case, we give them money, and we never hear from them again, which is very odd. We think, well, that's strange. We gave them $10,000. They never came back and asked us for any more. I wonder why not. Didn't they like our money? You know, what, what's the deal there? It's just, it's very odd when that happens. And our, our donor is curious about it. And frankly, the staff is curious about it as well. Yeah, and it's sort of puzzling, isn't it? It yeah. is. How was the move for you? I think, you know, a lot of the questions, I was looking at a lot of the tweeting, tweeted questions that came in. And how was that move for you moving from the world where you can be passionate about an issue for you as it was women's issues uh, and then you move to the side where you're giving the money away and i hear from a lot of people they say oh wouldn't it be great to work at a foundation personally i i i find it that it would be hard because you know like i'm a a get things done sort of person and I, it would be hard to be in the back seat in some ways but tell me about that transition well, it, for it's, you. it's interesting because somebody I get asked that question a lot and then yeah. people say to me oh what a great way to end a career oh my gosh that's how I want to that's what I want to do <laughs> you know that's where I want to end up but I, I always say to them you know it's very interesting when some when you go to pitch what you love to somebody and that person who you've pitched your issue to says yes and writes you a check there is no greater feeling mm -hmm. than the feeling that somebody is going to reward you with, with the investment of their money because they agree that what you're asking them for is worthwhile. So nothing takes the place of that. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is just a wonderful feeling. But on the other side of the table, it has its own set of challenges, to be sure. It's difficult. You know, we, we run up against some interesting I should have written down some of the stories that have happened <laughs> over the years. You know, it's, it's, we've asked for money back from people. Well, have. We have, and we've gotten it back. Wow. Um, people didn't build what they said they were going to build, yeah. or they wrote us and said things like, uh, well, thank you for your money last year. We really enjoyed it. We didn't actually use it for what we said we were going to use it for, but we used it for this and blah, 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 blah. And so then we have to call them and say, excuse me, you signed a contract yeah. where you said the money was going to be used for a X, Y, Z, and you yeah. used it for ABC. That really wasn't part of the contract. <gasps> why didn't you call us and ask us? Chances are we would have said yes, we, you could, but you didn't ask. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm afraid you're going to have to write us a check and give it wow. back. Wow. So, I mean, the, there's a contract, you know, it's, it's yeah. a contract like anything else. And if you don't fulfill the part of your contract, you get it back. But that's really not answering your question. Your question really okay. has to do with how I, 
I related when I moved over to the other side of the table. It's a very, a very different set of challenges. The, yeah. ch the challenges are um, really digging deep, doing these deep dives into the organizations and really looking at yeah. them, you know, their financials, um, their mission. And you get a chance to multitask and you're seeing a lot of different oh, organizations. You do. And yeah. what we've done, interestingly enough, in the last year, I've been with this foundation now for almost, four, for almost 14 full years. Wow. And last year, we decided to, to do something differently. So we are now asking for, for our, our grantees to appeal to us by sector. So the first, we've divided the year into quarters, and the first quarter is health, and the second quarter, education, the third quarter, human services, and the four, excuse me, the third quarter is capacity building mm -hmm. and, and, and community and civic, and the fourth quarter is human services. So what's been interesting for us is to look at all these things at the same time, mm -hmm. as opposed to scattered throughout mm -hmm. the year. And I don't know if it's been good for the grantees, because now they're really getting compared with one yeah. another. Um, but we, we've, stayed, we've stayed true to a lot of our friends who we yeah. feel are doing a good job. But it's been very interesting for us to really evaluate things in a very concentrated way. More and more people are doing that, though, right? I'm seeing more and more foundations, more corporate givers that sort of evaluate, you know, what metrics are these organizations reaching? I mean, there's there's some hard numbers that they're expecting or they're expecting real progress, and they're certainly expecting best practices. Well, best practices for sure. But uh, as a as a um, as a foundation person, I frankly, I like evaluations and um, I like qualitative stuff. But I am really interested in, excuse me, I like quantitative stuff, but I, the qualitative mm. is to me the most important because you, somebody will say, well, we served 100 people last year and this year we served 200. Mm -hmm. And so my question w to them would be, how were those 100 people you served last year, how did they do? Did they learn something if it's an education thing? Did, are they healthy? Are they able to stay in their job? Are they, are, were they well trained? Can they read? I'm more interested yeah. in the in that than frankly them serving twice the number of people who yeah. they served the previous year. And I think our my colleagues are pretty much the same, at least in our foundation, pretty yeah. much the same. We're interested in the numbers, of course, but the but the qualitative stuff, which is part of the best practices right. that you're talking right. about, that stuff is really very important to mm -hmm. us. Now one of the things that's interesting is that when you see you from the Simmons Foundation, maybe sitting along with other foundations uh, on a panel, you of all the, the panelists is much more likely to, to represent uh, a foundation that will give to maybe liberal causes, uh, maybe advocacy causes. Y you tend to operate certainly within foundation guidelines, but you're, you're maybe a little bit would you say you're more risk takers? I think we are more risk takers. And we, we say, actually, on our website, if somebody cares to go and look at the website while they're talking, yeah, they'll they see. They will. They're doing this as they, we speak, they, I know. If they go to the, the section that says values and they scroll all the way down to the bottom where, of the values page, they'll see that we say that if somebody has to pray or has to do something in order to be served, in order to get a bed that night, or to get food, we won't fund them. If, mm -hmm. if uh, there's an organization that won't provide funds for abortion services or contraception, we won't fund them. And we say that straight mm -hmm. up. Or any causes having to do with LBGTQ, all that, we, we say, you know, we're open to all of that. Yeah. This is not to say we fund every organization, sure. but it is to say that we're open to receiving things from all organizations. And any organization um, that, that we, we fund many faith-based organizations, we like to say, but we try very hard not to fund the faith. Mm -hmm. um, the you other, like the work that they're doing. I like the work that they're doing. We just try very hard not to fund the faith, if we can possibly avoid that. Um, but you asked another question in there, too, that... Risk takers. Risk, well, advocacy, that's yeah. what it was. Yes, we do a lot of advocacy. We, well, you're... Sure. The Children at Risk is yeah, an advocacy yeah. organization. Long time supporters. And of ours. a lot of people won't fund you because right. you are advocacy. Right. And but we're willing to step out there and do that. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you get I mean, when you're, you know, in the dark in in the back rooms with just your other foundation friends, do they question you about any of this stuff or not really. Yeah. I mean, I think that we each value what the other does. Um um, we will have, I, I just remember when I first went into this, to this side of the table, yeah. and I would be meeting with colleagues, and I'm a big believer in operating funds. Mm -hmm. So we meet with colleagues, and I would give my pitch, operating funds, operating funds, operating funds. Well, I'm, I was a former executive director of a nonprofit. 
I know how important operating funds yeah. are. If you can't turn the air conditioning on, if you can't pay your staff, you know, if you can't buy the paper for your letterhead, you can't do the program. Mm -hmm. So I'm big on operating funds. So we have always given operating funds, and I've tried to talk my colleagues into it. More and more foundations are doing that. Right. And I remember when, when the person hired me to be in this job, I said to her at the time, the minute we don't fund operating funds any longer is the day you get my resignation on wow. your desk. Wow. I mean, I feel that strongly about it. And she, she was very good with that always. Mm -hmm. and, and we always wonder when people don't ask for operating funds. Well, here, it's so interesting, Bob, because what people end up saying is, well, we really didn't think you meant it. <laughs> and we say, well, you know, there's a little box. You can check the boxes as operating, there's a little box. You can check the boxes as program. And up until this year, you could check the box that said capital. But if you didn't think we meant it, it's right there. You know, check yeah. the box. And, and so I always try to tell people that when you find a foundation that will give operating funds, ask, ask for, for them that. because yeah, yeah. they're far less restrictive than Well, there are very else. few. I mean, you guys are one of the few that we get operating funds from. Uh, so it's and, th and that's sort of an interesting thing. I, I did want to bring up though, uh, last semester uh, I we did a class here and it was on leadership, and I had Maria Trujillo, who's the head of the Houston Rescue and Restore, the big human trafficking group. And I remember a number of years ago when Children at Risk was starting to do some work on trafficking, and I went just to, we were just talking. I think it wasn't anything else. And you said how there were groups that you were like almost begging to give That's money true. to support human trafficking. We had them over to our office and then they never asked us for money. We never understood that. They do now. Yeah. But at the time, and we actually invited them over, we had gone to something at Rice on trafficking mm -hmm. a number of years ago. I think you were involved in yeah. that. Yeah. And we invited some people that day, that night at, at the event. I actually asked somebody to come to our office, which they did. But now we're in, we're, we, we fund a lot of tra trafficking yeah. uh, programs and projects but uh, and organizations that deal with that but it was hard you know some people don't really believe that you mean it you know what the problem is that we're intimidating to people mm -hmm. even though we think we're open and we think we're nice people and we think that um, you had you had who was here last week you said David David Ruiz, David from Ruiz. Make of America. he's a lovely guy yeah. I mean but but people get nervous. They don't yeah. think that, they, you know, they, they think you're different. And we try to say, no, we're human like everybody else. We do all the same things that you do. We just happen to have money and we're able to give it. That, that's our job. Our job is to give the money away. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a challenging, it's challenging work, but it's, I tell you, I feel so privileged to be mm. doing this kind of work and to have the kind of donor who's permitting us to stretch in the directions that you've already mentioned. Yeah. That's, that's been wonderful. Yeah. Do, do people who want to get grants from the Simmons Foundation, do they just call you and visit with you? Do you have a lot of that happening every we day? We do, we do. And you're happy to take most of those meetings? We do, but then we have some who call us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we have those too. <laughs> Why are they doing that? And they think well, they, that they want we money. want all that information from them. Oh, and see. I've got the newest report, I've got the latest this, I've got the latest that, I want to talk to you, I want to meet you for coffee. Thank you very much, but you know it's okay. Just send it to me. They're working extra hard to steward <laughs> know, the steward. They yeah. don't have to do that. It's okay. Wow. But I mean, it's it's overkill. Some of them yeah. go way over the top. So if if uh, if I'm a member of the class and I'm thinking about uh, joining uh, a nonprofit or starting a nonprofit or I'm new, the new director of development and I want to meet foundation people, is it always as easy as getting on the phone to the Simmons Foundation and scheduling a meeting? Because many foundations are going to have a little bit more of uh, a gate, aren't they? Well, I think so. But the other thing is, you know, we've got three program officers. Some foundations have a program. Yeah. The Brown Foundation, they give away wow. 70 some million dollars a year and they've got one program officer. So, but they, they give in such large chunks to so many interesting things that, that what she's doing, you know, the, the, the board takes a huge role in yeah. that particular foundation. But um, there are gatekeepers to be sure. Uh, but a lot of foundations are a lot more open than people think they are. I think that's absolutely right, right? They're much more open than people are going to think they are. Yeah, it's, I mean, as a as a as a executive director, I remember being very frightened to get it to 
call the, the Houston Endowment at the beginning. Mm. It took me two or three years to get to where I felt that our organization was ready for mm -hmm. the endowment. And then I met somebody there two or three times before I actually submitted anything. Mm -hmm. They were very kind and they did fund us. But it took a while, I think, for the organization to get sophisticated enough to be in a position to ask. And then I think we had to build the relationship before wow. we asked. Uh, I remember my first meeting with the Houston Endowment, and it was with uh, Emily Todd. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting with her, and I think I was asking for a program for $75,000 or something like that. And she said, no, you need to ask for, for a, a, lot, a more. lot more. And she brought me to meet George. <laughs> and, right. I, you know, uh, three months later, I had $750,000 for after-school programs. I know. And it's just sometimes grant officers can just sort of guide you along, especially if you're doing something that's important. Absolutely, and right now we've got an organization that's, that we have, the board hasn't voted on yet, but they've asked us for a very small amount of money, $7,000. I'm recommending 10. Mm. So that happens too. Yeah. So we, we're going to give more because we think it's worth. That must feel really good it's too, doesn't wonderful. it? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It's interesting because when I first went to work there, um, um, one organization asked us for, um, what was it? I think it was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or hundred thousand or something. I forgot what it was now. And um, we sat around the table. I was on the board. I wasn't working there at the time. I was just on the board. Um, but we sat around the table, and the board made made some decisions. And then the donor says, "No, I don't. I don't want to give him a hundred thousand dollars a year for four years. I want to give him five hundred thousand. Wow. So I said, "Well, can I call her and tell her?" And she said, yeah. So I picked up the phone and I called this person. And I said, I just wanted you to know that we're not going to give you $100,000. You know, and she said, oh, well, what are you going to give us? And I said, well, we're going to give you $500,000. And she, there was this long pause. And she said, you know, the only other organization, the only other foundation that has ever done that, and she said, there's only been one, was another one that was where the woman was the head of it. Oh, wow. So it's interesting that some things just resonate, you know, and you Women just are want so to much do nicer more. in this deal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, men are men are good too, but it's just interesting. <laughs> that was a women's organization, yeah. and it was a woman who did it. And this, and then she came to us, and as our donor is also a female. Wow. So wow, tell me, I want to get back to, I want to talk a little bit more about foundations, but I want to learn a little bit about you, or I want our the audience to learn a little bit about you, Linda. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in northern Illinois in a, in a town outside. I was born in Chicago, uh -huh. grew up in, went to Waukegan, and, now, and grew up in Rockford, Illinois. And then I, I don't think I ever knew that. Yeah, and then I went to college at Tulane Newcomb. Oh, yeah. I'm a graduate of it Newcomb. It was all girls It was at the all time? girls when I was there, yeah. right? So I'm a graduate of Newcomb. And then I got married and moved to Houston. Wow, wow. And your first job when you got to Houston? My first job when I got to Houston was with an insurance company, and then I went to work for at Rice. I worked in the Rice uh, University Library. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever go back to Rockford? I haven't been there in a long time, oh, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, and then how did you end up getting into the fundraising world or into the nonprofit world? Well, it's interesting. I have always had a passion for women's issues, mm. always, always. And so... Um, can you talk about that maybe briefly? How, how did you get yeah, a passion for women's I, issues? I don't know where that came from, uh, but I have a deep-seated passion for women's issues. I was involved with the ERA. I was mm -hmm. always involved with the choice, all those things having to do with women. And, um, and then I, um, I went to two international conferences, um, about the U United Nations-sponsored yeah. conferences, one in 1985 in, um, in, in Nairobi. Oh, that was a big one. And one in, well, these were all yeah. UN big conferences. They, the second one was in 1995 in Beijing, and that's the one where Hillary Clinton said, you know, um, human rights are, women's rights are human rights, and mm -hmm. human rights are women's rights. And um, they were amazing conferences to attend and I felt really privileged to be there but I started that work you know in the volunteer world you know for a long time and then I um, I ended up um, um, working at the Greater Houston Women's Foundation mm -hmm. and that was a woman's fund which funded programs that related to women and girls I think one of your questions that I you gave me a list yeah, yeah. of questions earlier that said you know what was your favorite campaign or something and 
And when I was there, we were we worked with Sterling and Associates, yep. and so we came up with a with a campaign. We had three programs. Uh, it was educate. It was grant making, education, and research. And so we had these three little links, these three little circles that represented each of those, and they were linked together. And it was investing today for women tomorrow. Mm. That was the slogan that mm -hmm. went along with the campaign, and I still like that. Yeah. And I used to. Um, I used to go to national meetings and we'd have t-shirts that said, give us your dollars, we'll make change. Oh, And I always nice. thought that should be like the national <laughs> mo motto for all women's groups because it just speaks to the, right, yeah. but that was, you know, that was 25 years ago. I could ago. use that. Y yeah. give, give us your dollars, we'll make change. <laughs> Anybody could use yeah, it. Yeah. But it was the Greater Houston Women's Foundation that had it on the t-shirt. Well, so. And how long were you there? I was there almost 10 years. I was at Metro for nine years before that in the government oh, wow. relations, government affairs, community relations. Oh. And then I went um, uh, to but something, little something in between, and then went into with the Women's Foundation, and then went right from there to, I re actually retired for about five months, and um, <laughs> I got convinced that I should go back into the workplace, and so I went to work for wow. the Simmons Foundation. That's been a good move. It's, it was wonderful. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, the 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 donor and I are, are good friends, and I was a little reluctant at the beginning to go to work for a close friend, thinking mm -hmm. that might not be wise, but that was 14 years ago, and we're still good friends. Wow. So. so it's worked out. <laughs> it seems to have worked out, right. So as you look at lots of different nonprofits that come to you for money, and some that have been coming for many years, are there characteristics of the really good nonprofits? Yeah, the characteristics are great leadership. You know, there are, that you have to have good good space to do stuff in. You've got to have the right equipment. You have to have good technology today. You know, technology is, is so critically important. But the leadership is critical, and leadership training. We're great believers in also professional development. Mm -hmm. So we will fund professional development for organizations. Mm -hmm. That's usually very difficult money to get. That is, yeah. And. Um, so all those little infrastructure things that are important to an organization, um, good good uh, board, good board leadership, yeah. not just pro yeah. professional leadership, but good board leadership. So all the governance issues are very important. So those are, you you talked about best practices, yeah. but a lot of that's not only best practices; it's just the way that you should do business. Period. Yeah. And um, so we look at all of that when we we just like we do a lot of site visits, mm -hmm. and when we go out on a site visit and we see things that are chaotic or we see things that the, 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 the executive director isn't conversant on some things or if there's a board member there they they maybe just met them instead mm -hmm. of you know the board member really being mm -hmm. involved all that all that kind of thing tells us a lot about the organization and how it's being run so we say no um, so it's it's difficult to say yeah. no let me tell you and then and then we're trying to find some creative ways to do things too um, hmm. because the Simmons Foundation someday will sunset um, yeah. um, it's not in perpetuity um, and so as a result we're trying to find sort of creative ways to do some funding and and to that end we we've got some women's programs going for women vets and so we've organized oh, we pulled organizations together with women dealing with women veterans yeah. and the issues that they face capacity building we're looking at organizations that really need some infrastructure mm -hmm. and so we pulled together a group for that um, we're we're going to start at least next year this actually the end of this year we're going to start giving a lump sum to some organizations that are kind of umbrella organizations mm -hmm. and and so they're members can come to them for the money. Instead of funding the individuals oh, yeah, like sure. we've done in the past, we're going to give a lump sum and they'll have to go to them. Might not be as much as we've given in the yeah, past, but yeah. it gives us a chance to continue the relationship, continue to support the work, but still contract a little bit yeah, because wow. we're having to do that. Are you able to see uh, organizations maybe that grow through the years that are sort of uh, really performing like I mean can you give us examples of a couple sort of like overperforming groups or group groups that you have seen that they've done an exceptionally good job that you can name because sometimes I'll have people name sort of what are some of the better run organizations and they're going to name some of the usual suspects oh Texas Children's Hospital uh, the Grand Opera. Are there some smaller ones that maybe people? Well, some aren't of them are, of? are big ones too. I yeah, mean, I know. The neighborhood centers, right. huge, wonderful organization. We had Imelda Douglas here. A well, there weeks you go. Yeah. I mean, wonderful organization, yeah. very well run. Um, um, you've got obviously the United Way, very yeah. well run. Um, um, I think uh, um, 
career and recovery resources yeah. is another good one that seems to be well run. Um, but there are there are small ones too, and I'm trying to. I mean, there's there's little kind of little mom and pop ones. Mm -hmm. There's a program that goes on at Lamar High School with just some girls in the high school, and the woman works with them, and she takes them on field trips, exposes them to art, literature, all kinds of things, and um, and then gives them a thousand dollars towards their their college degree oh, wow. if they continue with her. So that's a little little tiny program. But being very effective. But very effective. Yeah. And and frankly, our, we like we like those little ones that c we can really make an impact because sometimes when somebody asks us for operating money for an organization that's got a huge budget, yeah. and those we'd rather fund the program because yeah. operating just gets lost. Right. Um, but for for the you know the up to can be a couple million dollar mm -hmm. annual budget you know we'll do operating. Yeah, one of the things Brian Green Brian Green mm -hmm. teaches a classes here teaches a class as well. One of the things he and I will sometimes talk about is how sometimes we see an organization with a great mission, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a great history, but certainly a, 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 a great potential future but they're completely underperforming, maybe not the right leadership or just hasn't come together. Do you sometimes see those organizations that you think, man, they could be doing so much better? I can tell you stories. Oh, please. You know, but yeah. I wish I'd thought about that. I've got a, I've got a script. We, we sometimes lead, uh, we work with, uh, I'm on the board of the Conference of Southwest Foundations, about mm -hmm. to be renamed Philanthropy Southwest. So, oh. um, but, Every couple of years, we do a new board member or a new staff retreat. Mm -hmm. That is to say, people who are new to the field, and we work with them for two or three days just to kind of, you know, explore the issues that we deal mm -hmm. with on a daily basis. And so, one of the things that I've done is that I draw these little scenarios, and I give them these little scenarios and say, "What would you do?" and um, one of them has to do with the people who didn't use the money the way they said. Yeah. You know, what would you do? But I mean, we've gone to one, our, one of our favorites is, is at, one of my colleagues did a site visit, and then after she came back, she got this email from somebody on the staff, blind email, oh. saying, um, I, I'm going to send you this email trail, and you just read it, and then you do what you think you should do. So we read it, and it's, it's from the executive director to the staff. And she says, the Simmons Foundation is coming to visit. We need to look busy. We need to be busy. <laughs> so why don't the staff members go into the vocational training session and sit at the computers and act like they're looking for jobs? Oh, wow. So we read that, and we go, oh, boy. Wow. <laughs> So we make an appointment with the executive director and go out and talk to her. And and it's interesting, she wasn't there. I mean, we set it up in advance, and then she had a complication, and she didn't show up. But before, and we said, well, we'll wait for you. You know, we'll, We're going to sit here, and we'll wait for you. So while we were waiting, her staff ended up saying things like, we told her not to do that. We said to her that that wasn't a good thing <laughs> to do. And so then when she came in, and she was defending it. I didn't really, it's out of context. And I said, well, how can it be out of context? I've got the whole email oh trail here, you know. So I said, you know, I just don't think we're going to fund you this year. I just think you need to think about this yeah. and um, reflect on how you run your show. And, um, and you can come back to us at another time. We funded them subsequently, but we yeah. did not fund them that year. Wow, wow. There are look lots busy. Of, there are lots of stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, my favorite little look busy thing, I saw a bumper sticker once that says, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, people who want to work in the foundation world, Linda. I mean, is it, is it something that usually most of the people working for you or working in other foundations have come from development? Uh, or, you know, if, so if I'm not, taking this not class and I'm thinking about this. Not necessarily. Um, um, we, we hired somebody recently who was, you know, I think everybody in the organization she came from did some development work, but I think she was interested in programming and getting um, children to enroll in the CHIP program. Mm -hmm. And so she was program oriented, but knew a lot about health care, knew a lot about children's health care, knew a lot about social media. You know, our foundation is very active in social media. Mm -hmm. We talked about that before yeah. we went on the air, how I'm, I'm not very literate in it, but this new staff person, she, we, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're everywhere. Yeah. And we've got this, I forget this, this feed that we get that, that somebody can sign up for and they'll get automatic notices if oh. we are doing something that they need to know about. And um, 
so it's. I need to follow you guys on you Twitter. Do, I mean, you do. I don't think do. I am. She's tweeting all the time, <laughs> and um, so I think that um, that there is a place for all kinds of talent. Our shop is very small, mm -hmm. um, and there are smaller ones than many smaller ones right, than are, ours. Yeah. Um, and so it's just you need need somebody who's got a. And because we fund generally, we don't have it like education is not our sole mm -hmm. focus. It is for for others. Um, and you need somebody who really likes the community, likes to be in the community, likes to be out there, uh, you know, understands the community, mm -hmm. um, is willing to put themselves out there and really get in the weeds a little bit and find out what's going on. We're uh, we're involved in a lot of stuff. I told you the Veterans told you yep. Capacity Building. We're also in, involved in a lot of homeless stuff, mm. especially uh, we've become active in something called Funders Together to End Homelessness. Oh, wow. So we're doing that kind of work, too. So we get into we, we get involved in a lot of different areas, and, and I think that's what's kept our staff engaged all these yeah. years because the other woman who's been there the longest time She's been there, you know, a good while, and she's there, frankly, because she's had opportunity. Mm. And I think that's part of the game too. Is, yeah. is, is I, as I said earlier, that I'm a strong believer in staff development. So you have to give people opportunities mm -hmm. to thrive and to be excited about a project and to kind of have their own head. And mm -hmm. and that's I think that's wonderful when you see somebody grow like that. It's, yeah. it's really just a marvelous thing. And when you go to hire a new staff, and I know over the we, years you've hired a We've only done it once. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then you hired Amanda too? Long, well, yeah, years but ago, that so. was a yeah. long time ago. And Amanda, <laughs> actually, actually, Amanda came to us. Um, the woman who was there left, and Amanda said, I'd like to try to do that if I could. And I said, well, let's, let's go for it. And, and I said, you just have to wipe the slate clean from what's happened in the past. If you can do that, we can move ahead and just mm. go on. She said, absolutely, let's go for it. So she ended up on the front desk mm -hmm. where Kay, you know, oh, yes. where Kay is. And then when the other, when, a, when our program officer left to go somewhere else, she said, I'd like to think about that. Oh. And in the meantime, she had gone on some side visits and done some things already. So she kind of knew what yeah. was going on. And so she did that, and she's just been thriving ever so since. So she sort of worked her yep, way up. Yep, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And it's just wonderful when you see that happen. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions okay. um, from some of the students. Um, let me see. Nicole has a question here. How many faith-based organizations do you guys fund in general? Um, and are there restrictions? And you've talked a little bit about that. Already. Well, we fund a lot of faith-based. I don't know how many because I'd have mm -hmm. to go and count. But a lot of the what we used to call zip code ministries, which are ministries that are located all over town, and they're and they're they function as maybe seven or eight to ten zip codes, and a lot of congregations in the area support the, that ministry so that they can give basic needs. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of you know food, shelter, clothing. Um, sometimes job training, sometimes GED education, that kind of stuff goes on at those ministries. Yeah. But that would be a good example yeah. of a faith-based organization. And there are a lot of faith-based groups that yeah. are doing wonderful work yes, that don't are. demand anything That's of their correct. clients. Yeah. Absolutely. Search, well, search is not faith-based, but search, I mean, a lot of homeless Mission faith, of Hope. Yeah. Well, a lot of them are faith-based. And yeah. so, you know, we have to, we tread a little carefully, yeah. but search is not. Search is yeah. exactly the kind of organization we like to fund. Now, now, Nicole also had another question that I wanted to ask is, how did you become a delegate a delegate to the two United Nations? Oh, <laughs> well, I was active in an organization called the American Jewish Committee, and they sent a delegation, the, the women's group sent a delegation to the non-governmental forum. It wasn't the official forum. It was mm -hmm. the non-governmental, but the non-governmental was so much more fun than the official conference, because the official conference, you have to do what your country tells you to do. With the non-governmental, you can do whatever you want, and you can go to all these different programs that all these not these NGOs, you know, are mm -hmm. giving lectures and giving demonstrations. And so, I went as a part of this delegation with the American Jewish Committee, and um, and I did it tw two times. And I'd go a third time if I had the opportunity. Yeah. Is there going to be another big? Uh, well, you know, they've solved all the women's problems, so <laughs> no, there doesn't need to be another. There are no more women's there problems more in the problems, world. Right. <laughs> uh, Sandra Helsher has a good question. First, she thanks you for the funds that you gave to assist homelessness. She works in the in the homeless area, and she, but she wanted to know about many foundations have geographic limits to we what do. they fund, and what are we your do. geographic limits? Our geographic limits? limits are Greater Houston and contiguous counties, and pre-selected cities. And so we like? get like Steamboat Springs, Colorado, because our donor has a home there. 
oh, wow. and like Tucson, Arizona, uh, Phoenix, I'm sorry, Phoenix, Arizona, which is um, where one of our board members resides and is working with a very fine faith-based organization. Mm -hmm. And is it only to that one organization in Phoenix? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but there are several organizations in Steamboat that we've supported. Yeah. But lots in Houston. Oh it's yes. Really well, that's Houston. that's. Yeah. I mean, the, the vast majority. And most foundations have some sort of limit, and there are very few organizations in Texas that say all of Texas. Well, the Meadows Foundation funds all yeah. of Texas, you know. But um, yeah, there are very few that yeah. do that. Maybe Sid Richardson, you know, a little bit. But um, you know, the endowment doesn't fund all of Texas. No. And yeah. they give away eighty-two million dollars a right. year. So they and Brown Brown used to do more. Of, I don't know. I, don't I mean, know I, I think they anymore. stay pretty close to home too. Yeah, but. and the largest foundations, uh, and maybe we could jointly do this because I don't know this. It's it's Houston Endowment, Brown. Well, now this Episcopal Health. Episcopal, but but Arnold would be in there as well. The Arnold Foundation. Yeah, right? and I think Cullen and Cullen, um, yeah. um, I gotta think. Of, I gotta think about this. Well, those are the sort of the top those ones right the there. Biggest, yeah, but were them probably. Yeah, and I was talking to uh, Elena uh, Marks just mm -hmm. the other day. She's mm -hmm. so excited about taking over that Episcopal. I, I was so thrilled that she got that job. What a great person for that job. Perfect. Monica Science has a really great question. What would you consider to be a successful year for the Simmons Foundation? Year, I mean, do you guys measure your success year to year, and how do you define it? Well, we do an annual report every year where we have a chance to really look at what the year has been like. But I think that these new in initiatives like the homelessness and mm -hmm. the veterans, and that's kind of, that's exciting for us to be involved in new initiatives like that. So I would say that that would be one way we'd look at a, at a good year. Um, the other time would be perhaps that we didn't have to ask anyone for their money back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That would also be good, um, but I think that knowing that our knowing that our grantees are thriving and knowing that we've helped them get to the place where they need to be, where they're helping more people do what they yeah. can do to succeed in life, I think that that would be a successful mm -hmm. year for us. So it's not a hard; it's just sort of a feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> I think so. yeah. Amy Cole Guzman wants to know. And <clears throat> we may have talked about this. What's the biggest mistake a nonprofit can avoid making after receiving a grant? Is it the ones that disappear, the ones that don't use it correctly? I guess those are some well, of the things we've talked about. Well, I think that you definitely want to use your funds wisely and you want to report on the use wisely. And, and you want to definitely do what your contract says you took the money to do. If you don't, do, and, and frankly, if you communicate, I mean, communication is the key. Mm -hmm. If you communicate with the foundation and say to them, Look, we started out thinking that this was what we needed to do. As the year progressed, we realized that this is what we need to do. Can we do that? And we frequently will say, of course you can do that. Yeah. We just got a request the other day with an or from an organization that asked that very thing. We started out thinking this is what was going to happen. It turns out we, were, we miscalculated. We'd like to use the money here, and therefore we won't be finished. We, our report won't be available until several months later because we didn't know that this was going to happen, and we said fine. Yeah. So it's communication. I, I think people would be amazed at uh, how f to understand how far openness and uh, truthfulness goes in working with foundations. Exactly. I mean, I have found that the more you tell them, as, as long as you're not oversharing, right? right but right. the more you let them know what's happening, they're willing to go along with it. And I think so. We had a grant uh, from a, a foundation for 300000 for a building we were thinking of mm -hmm. doing, and they were an early funder. And after a number of years, we just realized we're not, we're not going to build this. And I would say we had this money for five years, but we always kept it, right? Mm -hmm. And we finally said, you know, we're not going to build this building. So what'd you do with the money? So what we would like to do is just use it on programs. And you know, I was amazed that they were like, sure, no problem. You know, and, and, uh, and we told them exactly what we were going to do. But we were also, and as a board, I think the board was all ready to give it back. I mean, they're all, you know, they basically everyone's like, yeah, they don't, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to want to. Well, we've, we, we don't give capital anymore as of this year, yeah. but up until this year, after this little, we had this little experience a number of years ago where the, the organization got $100,000 from us and um, never broke ground. Mm -hmm. And after we made the fourth payment and they still hadn't broken ground, we finally decided that we asked for the money back, but we also decided that we're not, we can make the pledge but we're not going to give any money until they've actually broken ground. Well, that's the way to do it. Right? Well, that's what yeah, we yeah. learned. But yeah. we had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. 
Yeah, we make mistakes along the way, too. <laughs> so I don't want anybody to think that we're without sin. We, we, we do it, too. Amy Rogers has a good question. She wants to know, is there one thing that a nonprofit can include in their funding request to make them stand out? Well, that is a good question. I think good spelling. <laughs> Um, using the not, we've had people. I got a letter today addressed to the KDK Harmon Foundation in um, in oh, Austin, no. and I called the people who sent the letter, and I said, you know, I never got this letter before, and I know you sent it, you sent it, you said you sent us something, and I started reading all the material, but the letter is to them, and she said, I don't understand, and I said, well, I'm just telling you what the letter says. So the letter is not to us. So she goes on, and she she says, oh, oh. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so. I said, well, it's okay. It's okay. You just need to know that we never got it, and there's a reason we never got it. Because she says in the email, you know, I this is in, you know, I never heard back from you, and this. So I'm oh. resending the information, which well, never heard back from us because we never got it because she sent it to the wrong person. So I think I think don't make the mistake when you do when you do your write your grant. It starts off, you know, Dear Linda and the Simmons Foundation, and then somehow in the bottom as it goes through, and you're using your boilerplate stuff, all of a sudden it says something about Houston Endowment. Oh. Or it says something about the Powell Foundation. or it's, And so they just didn't go back and read it. So just be aware yeah. that the word form and the word from all have the same letters, but they don't have the same meaning. So read, read, read. Just be sure that... And you see that way more than you want to see. We do. Yeah. We do. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so Richard Kendall wants to know, as the executive director, do you directly impact fundraising and development efforts? I did when I was with the yeah. Women's Foundation. We, don't, we do not raise do money. Not raise we money we have a donor who has given us money for the foundation, and so we don't raise any money. We just have the opportunity to share it. And year to year... So when there's a bad year, Denise Small has a question that I'll paraphrase from. Uh, if, if there's a bad recession, how does that impact well, that's your... Well, that's an actually a very good question because in, in 2008, when we went into that deep dive um, recession, we felt um, very strongly that that was the time when we needed to keep doing at the same level, keep giving at the same level that we gave before because they, the, the organizations really needed the money and we were just going to have to suck it up and go for it because we felt that was the time we needed to be there mm. for them. Mm. And so we did not decrease our funding wow. even in the depth of that. How did that impact the foundation overall? It did. It did. <laughs> are you giving out less today because of that? Mm. But you kept it up. Yeah. You helped all those organizations. Did you see some organizations go under be, because of the the what happened? Well, some go. Under I saw that happen the, in Dallas. That's yeah, why some, I asked. Some go under all the time, but you know what? We have way too many nonprofits. <laughs> I mean, you you know that probably yeah, better than most people. And and you know, Ronnie Haggerty at United Way, and always talks and about that. we always are on the same page. I mean, we just say no, no, no. Go under the umbrella of another organization. Take your program, put it somewhere else. You don't need your own nonprofit. I think people think that they're, it's so unique and so, so very different, but it's really not. And furthermore, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a nonprofit. You have to oh, really, wow. you know, there's, there's IRS reports. There's all kinds of stuff you have to do, mm -hmm. filing with the state. I mean, there's, there's stuff that goes with that. Yeah. So if you don't need to do it, don't do it. Yeah. Do you, do you ever uh, encourage foundation uh, nonprofits to merge with each other? Have you seen much of that? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's like a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually, my organization that I was with tried to merge with another organization, and they got pretty close, but yeah. it didn't happen. Planned Parenthood merged with um, the Planned Parenthood operations in Louisiana, southern Louisiana, yeah. New Orleans, and Baton Rouge. So that's worked well for They're now Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast. Yeah. Um, so they have done it, but it doesn't happen too often. It should happen more. It should. You know, I feel like it should happen a lot more, and. Uh, you just look at Brian Greene's organization when the food bank merged with right, End with Hunger. Target. Yeah, End Hunger, right. It was, right. Uh, I mean, they're doing fantastically right. great things now. Right. And uh, it's interesting. The more that you see groups try to merge, you, see, you have other groups that are like, no, our board doesn't want to merge. You know, well, so. it's this loss of control. Well, you know, the collaborative was a merger. That's true. With That's true. initiatives for children. So that that came to pass and the collaborative is still out there doing yeah. good work. People have to drop their egos though, that's a big part well, of it. Well, co 
uh, mergers are very tough. Yeah. And somebody has to say, as, as the person with initiative said, I don't want to be the executive director. That's fine. You know, and let, mm. she can do it. And yeah. so, but, but you have to have those kinds of personalities to yeah. be able to say that. And it's, a very, it's very difficult. It's not just control. It's, you know, you, you bring money to the table and you bring a program to the table. And the, the group that the Women's Foundation, start, which is now, by the way, the Women's Resource, mm -hmm. um, the, the group that they were going to merge with, you know, was strong, and, but, but so was the Women's Foundation. But somehow or other, they just... And then, of course, you hear the, this thing. Um, there was the Women's Home. There's the Women's Foundation. There's the Women's Center. There's the Women's Fund. And so, and so people would say, why don't you just all get together? <laughs> I mean, you're all are for women, yeah, so why don't you all get together? Same issue. And so we would say, well, actually, the Women's Home is for mentally ill women, primarily. Mm -hmm. The Women's Center is for abuse, women who've been yeah. abused and sec sexual, you know, sexually violated. Um, the Women's Fund is for women and health, and the Women's Foundation is, is different. They were funding anything having to do with women, and they were doing research on what was going on with mm -hmm. women and women's issues, and they were doing all kinds of things like that, but it just, they, but people hear the word woman, and they think, okay, well. Children's organizations. Yeah, same thing, same, same thing. thing. Why aren't all these children's Why aren't we merging with child advocates? Well, because, because they Because you're court very different. They're court-appointed special <laughs> advocates. Right. They're not, you know, they don't have anything to do with what you do. Right. I mean, they're exactly. involved with the, some of the children and some yeah. of the issues. It's but children. That's the, children. the, the, right. the common exactly. denominator. Exactly. Char Honda Cox has a great question. So when you're funding, do you have a bias towards women's groups because of your background? Uh, do I have That's a bias right. towards women's groups? So I don't have a bias towards women's groups, but um, um, I certainly do look at them. We, we do have a special effort. Because there is no women's fund in Houston any longer, a real organization yeah. that really funds only women and girls, we have taken seriously the idea of, we've always funded a lot of women and girls. In fact, we got accused by a board member years ago, that's all you do, and that, that, that's what made me go do an oh, annual really? report to prove to him that that's not what we did. And he was very surprised to discover, oh, they really don't fund a bunch of women's groups. But that, that is a bias in, in some respects, but it's not a bias where that's what, the only thing we'd fund, or we, we would always fund anybody who came to us for women's issues, no. But we do have a keen interest in women and a keen interest in girls, and so we're going to always have some money for that. Hmm. So uh, Marta Alvarenga has a great, great question. She knows that you're doing an education grantee info session on March 3rd. That's correct. And she wants to know, when you do something like that, what are your expected outcomes? What do you well, want to here, see Well, here, that's so interesting. And thank you, Marta, for asking us about that. We're the only foundation that does that, actually. We started this last year. Um, when I was with the Women's Foundation, we had an information session prior to our grants. And we always had standing room only in our offices mm -hmm. where people would come to say, well, how do we do this and what do we do and how do we apply? So I, I knew that for a long time before we actually ever did that at our foundation, but now, as of last year, we have held a session prior to each of the quarters that we fund in. We did, we've already done one the health, for health, because we're in the health quarter right now, mm -hmm. and that's about to be concluded. But the board meeting will be in early March, and actually the same day as the workshop that she's talking oh, yes. about. And so what we do is we, we review our letter of inquiry, we re review our application process, we answer any questions that anybody might have about what we're funding and where we would, where we would not. There are people there who we say to them point blank, you know, that's just not going. We will not fund mm. in that area. I'm sorry, it's just not going to be mm -hmm. an interest area for us. And we tell them right then and there. And so they say thank you very much, but they yeah. were very happy to be there. Yeah. Um, and then we also this year we started something new. We've invited some speakers in from other foundations, so they can ask people can ask them questions as well. So that's just a little add-on that we've wow. done and it's been very well received and I like the fact that we're doing it. I think that's terrific and as you said we're I think we're out there more than a yeah. lot of foundations are we're trying to do something innovative well, it makes and creative. Your job more interesting too to it be able to does. try these new things it right? It does absolutely. Wow. So um, Achal Mayan has a great question. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, foundations saying you need to collaborate more. We like to see collaborations. How do you guys look at collaboration when you see groups working together? 
Well, we love people who collaborate. I mean, this Funders Together is a collaboration yeah. of funders. Um, and we love people to be able to do that. And, uh, and one way of collaborating, I guess you could say that, is you've been very gracious for organizations to use you as a fiduciary. Yeah. So they don't have to form their own 501c3. They can use you at least right. for a couple of years right. to get something off and running. Um, but collaboration is always good. We like organizations to work together. And when people say to us, we work with uh, AMA, we work with uh, um, Vicino Health, we work with, and they tell us all these, and then I call them. I said, do you know XYZ organization? I did this with one just recently. I, I called AMA and I said, do you work with these? I don't know who they are. I said, well, here's what they do. And she said, well, let me check with the guy who does that piece of yeah. our program. She did. She said, no, they've never called us. Wow. So even though that may be, I don't think it was intentional that they were trying yeah. to pull the wool over our eyes. I think that when push comes to shove, they would call, they would call them, but they just haven't done it yet. But that's interesting. But they that's put it in what a grant, they though. put it in a grant, and I don't think they should have done that. Wow. So I mean, collaboration could mean is not just necessarily collaborating on a given program, but using other agencies to help fulfill your mission, where you where you can do this piece. Somebody else may be able to do this piece. That you've got the client, mm -hmm. so call them to come over and do this piece for you, whether it's financial literacy or whatever it is. If that's not your expertise. That's where the collaboration comes in, and that's wonderful when you can do that. One last question from uh, our tweeting audience before I go to our final five questions. Uh, Achal wants to know if you recommend that nonprofits hire a uh, or contract with a grant writer. What do you think about that? Well, <laughs> they do it all the time. The, yeah. the issue really becomes, does the grant writer get it? Yeah. If the grant writer gets it and is a good grant writer, not a problem. But so many times we see grant writers who really haven't gotten it. Yeah. But that is to say, they, the, the passion that I talked about from the very beginning, if they don't understand that and they can't articulate that well on, in the written word, you know, you mm. need to read that proposal and make sure that that grant writer, or read pr proposals the grant writer's written in the past, and just be sure that they say what you want them to say. There have been a couple of grants, and we don't even fund this area anymore, but um, I remember Wilderness Houston sent us a proposal years ago, and it was gorgeous. Mm. It was just gorgeous. And Planned Parenthood used to do gorgeous, and still does, but very mm. well-written proposals. Mm. It was always such a pleasure to get one that just sings off the page. Wow. Wow. That's nice. Uh, let me ask you a couple of just sort of fun questions. Um, do you have a favorite restaurant in Houston? I do. I have two. Okay. Okay. One of my favorites is Beck's Prime on Westheimer, where the trees are, because we love <laughs> oh, yeah, you sitting can sit under, out those under, under those gorgeous two hundred year old trees and eating a really good hamburger. Yeah. They're um, expensive though, I mean as hamburgers go, right? Well, we, I always get the chicken, but it's a great sandwich yeah. and the trees are just glorious. And then and then Olivet at the Houstonian, which is a quiet oh, wow. restaurant with excellent food and beautifully presented and people aren't really because it's a hotel restaurant, people don't really think of it, but it's one of our absolute favorites. Work life balance. And I and I want to ask you this because we've had a number of women sit in this seat and uh, development uh, directors, and they've they would admit that they've had a very tough time with work life balance. It is I mean, tough. What, what do you I think? don't have small children. Yeah, and I have a husband who spends a great deal of time in Colorado, where he skis in the winter mm -hmm. and where he golfs in the summer. So I'm alone a lot, and as a result, I work a lot because. I don't have anything else to do. And my mm -hmm. friends are busy with their families mm -hmm. or their grandchildren or their children or what have you. And so um, work-life balance to me has always been a little tricky. My children don't live here. I have nobody here except friends mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and my husband on, on occasion. <laughs> so, I mean, women can get, it's, it's tough. I think yeah. it's really tough. And, um, and I find myself, I would go in on Saturdays, I would go in on Sundays, but so now I'm working a 30 hour week. So I'm only oh, going all. in, I'm only going in three days now and I'm working, just figuring know, out the rest. Sort of nice, huh? So well, you know, it's time. 
And so it's how, so people kept saying, can you do it? Are you going to be able to do that? Because I'm really worried. I don't think, and they're saying that at the office. Can yeah. you do it? And then when I come in on the wrong day, why are you here? Uh -huh. You know, what are you doing here? Well, because I'm not going to be here tomorrow, so I came in today. So I'm balancing, I'm trying to make that work. It's new for me because mm -hmm. I've never really had to do yeah. that. But, you know, it's, when you look at your paycheck and you realize it's been reduced significantly, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, yeah, right. Uh, is there a sort of a best set, best kept secret spot in Houston that uh, place that you really like to go to? I saw that on your list. And I was trying yeah. to think maybe of what under that the trees at Bex. Huh? That's true, but Rothko Chapel is oh, yeah. also one of my special places, and it used to be the Coptic Church that's no longer there on yeah, the campus. No. You it's know. Is that well, I think the building open? is still there, but I don't, you know, you can't, yeah. I don't, it, that to me was probably the most precious space in all yeah. of Houston. I just loved it there. It was just yeah. exquisite. Rothko's fan, a number of people have mentioned Rothko, yeah. and Emily Whitehurst has been uh, yeah. here, so yeah. which is uh, terrific. Uh, if they were making, our final question for the evening, Linda, if they were making the Linda May story in Hollywood, who would you have play you? Well, I can tell you who I would have playing, but I don't know if anybody would know who it was. I, I would like to think you would know who it was. So Anne Bancroft. <laughs> oh, well, I know. Oh, yeah, I know you would know. But, I mean, if anybody saw The Graduate. But to me, the reason I would say that is because she was married to Mel Brooks. That had to be oh, wow. the most amazing marriage. She was such a magnificent actor, and he has such a brain and so funny. So and funny. And I cannot even imagine how wonderful it must have been to be around the two of them. Yeah. Wow. Just love to see them together. So the uh, Columbia Pictures, the statue of yeah, the woman, you right. know, that is based on Anne Bancroft. I didn't know if you knew that. I the, don't know. The, the woman in the white. Yeah, the model for that. Do you remember the mouse that roared? Do you remember that movie, The Mouse That Roared? Yes. Because the, the little country. Wasn't that Peter no, Sellers was in that? I think it was Peter yeah. Sellers, but they, it was Columbia. And then they pick, the, the mouse oh. sort of picked up the hem of her dress and looked around and ran out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that yeah. part. So, Linda May, thank you so much it's for being pleasure. here. It's been a pleasure. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks for all the great work that you do here in thank Houston. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure working with you, Bob. I can tell you that. It's always, it's always been nice to be involved with thank your you. activities and the kinds of things that you do at Children at Risk. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So another week here at the Leadership Studio. We'll see you next time. Another great guest, I promise. And uh, keep up the great work. I love seeing your reactions. I love the work that's been going on. We'll see you next time.